Hey brothers and sisters, grace and peace to you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I pray you are well. If you are new here, welcome. The purpose of this channel is to encourage the body of Christ while we are watching for the rapture of the church and to point people to Jesus. So have you been feeling like this person in this picture lately? Are you facing waves that look like they will wipe you out? Is the enemy attacking from all sides? Maybe it's kind of ferocious and in your face, or maybe it's more subtle. Either way, you are not alone, and God has a word for us on this. In my Bible reading this week, I was in Ephesians 6, you know, the chapter with the armor of God. Well, I'm not going to talk about the armor today, maybe in the future, but today I want to talk about the word stand. The word is used three times in Ephesians 6, 10 to 14. The word withstand is also used. Apparently, a Christian standing is important to God. Here's the passage. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be, ye may, may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness. We are told to do a number of things in this passage, but let's start with stand. We are told to stand against the wiles of the devil. Stand is Strong's G2476. It means to stand still, stand firm, or keep in place. Withstand is Strong's G436, which means to oppose or stand against, to resist. When the enemy is coming at us, we are told to stand, not fight, not run away, but to stand and not be moved. Before we go further with exactly how to do this, let's take a look at what the wiles of the devil are. Thayer's lexicon defines wiles as trickery, craft, and deceit. To me, that sounds more like a mind game, although physical attacks are very real. In my experience, the mind is a particular target of Satan in his de deceiving ways. When I hear the word wiles, two examples from our culture come to mind. First, there's that phrase, the wiles of a woman, or feminine wiles, which refer to the art of flirting shamelessly with a guy or enticing by using covert means to get what you want. The other example that comes to mind is Wile E. Coyote from Saturday Morning Cartoons. That coyote's entire life purpose was to capture, destroy, and harass the roadrunner. It's as if Satan and his minions lie in wait or follow you craftily, looking for any opportunity to trip you up, discourage you, or deceive you, thereby leading you into sin. Did you ever notice how unconcerned the Roadrunner was? I don't know if Roadrunner was just careless and lucky or just confident in its safety. Looking at verse 12, we get a good picture of the army organized against us. We have the devil who is the commanding officer giving orders to frustrate the saints to his minions who actually have different ranks and assignments. These principalities, powers, and rulers of darkness are non-human, ethereal, and demonic. They are all engaged in active forms of evil designed to inflict pain on God's people. They are of the spirit world. They are the enemy, not the people in your life. Satan may use flesh and blood to attack you, but ultimately, that person is not the enemy. Satan is. A Bible teacher by the name of Simpson wrote, the tactics of intimidation and insinuation alternate in Satan's plan of campaign. He plays both the bully and the beguiler. Force and fraud form his chief offense against the camp of the saints. So we are to stand against that. What does standing look like? One who is standing is not reclining or overly relaxed. One who stands is mentally, physically, and spiritually ready and prepared. He or she holds their ground against the spiritual attack. One who stands holds the position and does not retreat. But how? How do we stand up under the onslaught of enemy attack? It sounds like a big order, but God has provided what we need. According to the passage, we are to be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might and to put on the whole armor of God. What I am seeing 
is that it all boils down to knowing God and building your faith. We know God by reading His Word and letting it saturate our thoughts. We use it as a lens through which to look at every situation, every hour, every day. Rooting ourselves in His Word provides us all the truth we need to stand against the wiles of the devil. Knowing the Word is huge, but so is trusting God to be faithful and to express His power through you and for you. God's might and power strengthen us, strengthen us as we rely upon it to, and we step out in faith and take our stand. One basic example of how to live this out would be when in the midst of extreme discouragement, we choose to praise the Lord and thank Him for the trial anyway. We can choose to thank Him in advance for the deliverance we believe He will provide, even though it may look different than what we imagine. But how do we strengthen ourselves in the Lord? What does that even mean? I won't pretend to know the entire answer to this, as I am still working on this myself. But one important way to be strengthened to stand is to take thoughts captive, as stated in 2 Corinthians 10.5. When those thoughts of fear creep in, like, what if I lose my job? Or what if I don't get well? We say, Lord, I take captive my thoughts that are full of fear and I give them to you. Please take them from me. Or, Lord, I confess I'm worried about blank. But I trust you and know that regardless of the outcome, you will protect and provide for me. He may not change the circumstance, but he will always sustain us through it. And those fearful thoughts are exactly what the enemy wants us focusing on. One way you stand is by dealing with those thoughts biblically. We can also strengthen ourselves to stand by remembering all God has done for us. Remind yourself of these gifts from God. We have a glorious standing with God as His children. He has made us a part of His great plan for the ages. He has a plan for our growth and maturity and will use these attacks for our good. He has filled us with the Holy Spirit and enables us to walk in the Spirit. The thing is, it's never really about our strength, but it's always about His working in us. Thank goodness. I'd be remiss if I didn't warn about things in our lives that sap our strength. A Bible teacher named Lloyd-Jones lists these things that can sap our strength. Committing to too many things, laziness, too much conversation, foolish talking and joking, too much time in the wrong company, arguments, debates, wranglings, love of money and career, desire for image and respectability, unequal yoking, ungodly entertainment, and not enough time in the Word. Spiritual warfare is a fact of life. Paul didn't say, put on the full armor of God and stand, just in case Satan attacks. He said, we do wrestle against the principalities. We are in a battle whether we realize it or not. But I am sure all of you are well aware of that. David Guzik, a pastor in California, says, we will be attacked. We must not be frightened. We must not droop, slouch, or cower, or be uncertain, or have a pity party. We are to be in position, alert. We do not even think of retreat. We are to stand, alert and focused, on our heavenly commanding officer. And here are some encouraging facts about those principalities that we battle against. One, they can't keep us from God's love. Romans 8.38 tells us that there is a limit to their power, we are not just conquerors, we are more than conquerors. 2. Ephesians 1, 20-21 tells us Jesus is enthroned in heaven, far above the principalities and powers. Ephesians 2, 6 says that in Christ Jesus, we too are seated in heavenly places. We are also above those principalities and powers in Christ. Certainly not on our own, but in Christ. Colossians 2, 10 tells us, that Jesus is head over them. Satan and his minions are not Jesus' opposite. He is on a far high, higher level than they are. And five, Jesus disarmed the principalities and powers at the cross. Therefore, our victory is rooted in what Jesus did and not in what we do. Jesus is the source of our victory. It does not depend on us. We are not told to fight, only to stand. As I'm thinking about what this looks like, I'm imagining an action movie where the big bad enemy is about to swoop down and take out the weak and frail protagonist. 
Our little hero is afraid. He squeezes his eyes shut and braces for impact that never comes because a savior character intervenes on his behalf. As I tell this, I realize how terrible I am at remembering movies, but I hope you get the point. Just as God fought on behalf of the Israelites, he will do the same for us. The example that comes to mind is when the Israelites were gathering at the Red Sea with the Egyptians closing in. Moses said to them in Exodus 14, 13 to 14, And Moses said unto the people, Fear ye not, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will shew to you this day. For the Egyptians whom ye have seen today, ye shall see them again no more forever. The Lord shall fight for you, and ye shall hold your peace. All they had to do was stand in faith, and God made a way and took out their enemy. Even though, more often than not, our enemy is invisible and is usually up in our heads, our instructions are the same as theirs. Stand and watch God work. Be of good courage, brothers and sisters, and look to your Savior for strength. He will strengthen. He will make your legs to stand. Just step out in faith. When the Israelite priests were entering the Jordan to cross over into the Promised Land, God did not part those waters until the priests moved to step in it. Stand in faith, stand on your wobbly legs, and look to see God's strength sustain you. I love you, brothers and sisters. Hold fast. If you have stumbled across this video, know it was no accident. You may be searching for some answers. I promise you, the only place to find the truth is in Jesus Christ and in His Word, the Bible. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. God wants to give you the free gift of salvation. He wants to adopt you into His family. How can you become a part of God's family? You call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. By calling on His name for salvation, it means you believe He is the Son of God, who shed his blood and died, taking the punishment for sin that all of us deserve, and that he rose again the third day. Once you believe that, you are saved and are eternally secure in your salvation. You are adopted as a child of the Most High God. You now have no fear of death, for when you die, you will be with Jesus in heaven. You also do not need to fear the future, for God holds your future in his hands. I pray you will believe on the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior.